This is Cthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to Cthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke. This week, I want to take a turn into Native American mythology, uh, and I want to talk about a creature who is known as um, Zunuqua. Uh, Zunuqua is a, uh, the legend of Zunuqua and the uh, dances associated with this particular figure, and much of the folklore comes from the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Canadian Pacific Northwest in particular, from a tribe, and I, you know, I'm challenging myself on pronunciation here, um, the Kwakwakewak tribe, okay, which is uh, in, which, which comes from that particular region of British Columbia. Now, um, this, I'm doing this podcast uh, upon request because I did have somebody um, from this tribe actually comment on one of my videos, and I'm, I'm going back trying to find which video it was uh, that she commented on. Because uh, she was talking about the uh, Kwakwakwak as being, or at least the particular um, tribe that she belonged to within that, because I think that um, Kwakwakwak refers to a, a group of tribes that are that are united by a common language, but yet the tribes are all quite distinct. And one of the things she mentioned to me uh, in her comment to me was that she's been trying to find good information about uh, Native, you know, Native American sort of dark feminine spirits. But, you know, not really coming up with anything that resonates with her experience as a member of that tribe. And, you know, and I found it, I was, I was trying to do this research, I could see the kind of difficulty that she was running into. Um, and part of that might well be because these different tribes, uh, you know, because they, even though they have a common language, it doesn't necessarily mean that they always have a, a common culture, okay? So there could be some beliefs or, or practices that are, that are vastly different between tribes. And certain ones are documented, and maybe other ones, for whatever reason, have not been. Uh, we did actually do a, a podcast on, you know, on Sedna from the Inuit. So this is my other uh, Native American, you know, uh, dark feminine figure that I was able to pick up. And one of the things that was noteworthy there is the, the sort of lack of, at least in their, that tribe, a lack of creation mythology, a lack of you know, divine masculine or feminine. Um, it just seemed that there was, you know, the a lot of these spirits represent uh, the natural forces that, you know, it, very animistic in that sense, you know, dealing mainly with natural forces and these uh, figures that, you know, could be seen as personifications, but they really represent the realities that people are facing when they're, you know, you know when they're hunting and fishing and, and that this is the way that they make their living and that the way that they live. Okay. And, and of course, the forces of nature in terms of, you know, storms, frozen tundra, cold weather, things like that, you know, in the case of the Inuit. Now, in the case of the uh, Kwakwakwak, um, of course, that part of British Columbia also, you know, potentially could be equally, <laughs> could deal with equal, uh, similar kinds of conditions. But the, this particular figure is interesting. Um, I, I um, uh, Zunakwa is... Uh, is like is a Bigfoot type creature. Okay, now there are cases of male uh, versions of this uh, Zunaqua, but they're mostly represented as female, and th this this particular figure is mostly represented as a female giant. And in fact, the appearance of this uh, of Zunaqua is more like what we would think of as a Sasquatch or or a Bigfoot, uh, realizing that Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and Yeti are not necessarily interchangeable terms for people who, uh, you know, work in and study that area of, um, you know, of cryptozoology. But nonetheless, in terms of appearance, she is a giant sort of hairy, um, ape-like woman uh, with purse pursed lips, apparently very, um, you know, lips that are puckered out, and, can, and it tries to attract children to her. She's also called the wild woman of the woods, and she tries to draw children with her with a hoo-hoo kind of a sound. Um, which if you, on YouTube, you can actually find some of the dances where the, you know, the tribal, the person uh, dresses up um, in a particular mask and, and looks like it's a set of gloves as well that um, represents, and a, co and a kind of long-haired costume that represents this, um, you know, this, this female creature. And the idea is that children, the story that was told, according to at least one of the elders who, um, 
I, I, who I'd listened to, was that if children were uh, were bad, they were they were told this story of the wild woman of the woods, uh, Zunoqua, who would come and you know lure them into the woods, put them in her basket, and then take them back to be devoured. So here we have another example of a, a kind of cannibalistic child eater, uh, which would make a, make this some, a figure somewhat distinct from what we would think of as a, a literal Bigfoot, because Bigfoot usually is not considered to be like they're they're big and scary looking for people who have had sightings of Bigfoot, but Bigfoot doesn't tend to Bigfoot just tends to go away, like you know just like everybody bugger off and leave me alone. You know Bigfoot doesn't seem to want to interact really with humans, so. It's not so much, it's not that, um, you know, a threatened Bigfoot might not, you know, there might not be stories of one, you know, trying to attack or, you know, somebody or, or jump on their car or, or whatever. Like there's been, you know, there are certain, certain stories I've heard over the years about that, but it wouldn't be, the, so I guess my point is that I would, I don't know that it's entirely accurate to say that even though this figure has the look of a Sasquatch, whether or not they're really the same uh, in terms of, you know, you know, what they're, you know, in, in terms of. You know, they're they're literally being a you know Sasquatch equals um, Zunoqua. I don't I don't know. I mean, to me, that makes me a little doubtful that that's the case. Nonetheless, I think the Bigfoot legend is is somewhat important here from these broader perspective of how we're looking at this in terms of the masculine and feminine. So, um, okay, so we're talking about Zunoqua as this this cannibalistic giant that looks like this this like ape like woman. Um, lives in the woods, okay? But one of the characteristics is she's considered to be very dim-witted, not very smart, at least in terms of she's she's kind of slow-moving and slow-thinking. So therefore, most of the stories that have been told of children being abducted by her have happy endings because the children managed to do something to outwit her and get away. Now, we saw this in some of the um, these these hag figures that were represented in Japanese mythology as well, you know, you had these um, these creatures who, uh, if you you know if, if they got you got caught in the in the trap or in the in the home or the the abode of one of these um, you know uh, these like yokai yokai like creatures, you could you know they, you know you could you know uh, if, with with enough um, with enough quick thinking you could get your way out of that situation. So. There's kind of this almost tricksterish motif here, but this being is not the trickster. It's usually the other people who have to uh, think on their feet <clears throat> because this is not a being that can be opposed. You know, like, the, the, you know, this is a big monstrous creature. This is not something you can just go in and attack and, and think that you're probably going to win, um, which I think is an important consideration here. So let's see what else we can, um, we can say about um, Zunoqua. Uh, says she's an ancestor of the, uh, I think I'm saying this right, the Namgis clan. I'm not sure if that's quite right. Uh, through her son, um, Siwalagame is the way I think this is pronounced. Um, there's not really any information that I can find on Siwalagame, um, only that this is her son, and that somehow uh, this gives her a ancestral connection to the people of this particular clan. And uh, here it says she's venerated as a bringer of wealth, but also greatly feared by children because she's known as an ogress who steals children and carries them home in her basket to eat. Her appearance is that naked, black in color, old monster with long pendulous breasts. Okay, we've seen the long pendulous breasts in, in other motifs in a lot of Asian um, discussions of, of dark feminine figures as well. And, and well, really, among sort of the Greek um, figures like Lam, uh, Lamia or um, Marma or Gello, uh, same thing, Mormo or Gello, the same, the same um, concept, okay? Described as having bedraggled hair. In masks and totem pole images shown with bright red pursed lips because she's said to give off, and said to give off the call, who, and it's told, often told to children that the sound of the wind blowing through the cedar trees is actually the call of Zunoqua. Um, and some myths say she's able to bring herself back from the dead. Mm, there's interesting an ability which she uses in some myths to revive her own children and regenerate any wound. She has limited eyesight, okay, that's another feature, and can be easily avoided because she can barely see. Uh, but are drowsy and dim-witted, possesses great wealth, and will bestow it upon those who are able to get control of her child. Okay, so I don't, and again, this whole idea of her child, there's not much information on who this child is. It's just that... Um, apparently she does have a child and, and it sounds from the the way that this um is described is that she's protective of this child but 
if somebody does take control of her child, that she will, um, you know, that that is a way to uh, to get her to bestow wealth, okay? And supposedly there's a myth now, I don't know, there doesn't seem to be a source for this. A tribe tricks her into falling into a pit of fire. They burned her for many days till nothing was left, which prevented her from reviving herself. It says, from the ashes of this fire, they turned into mosquitoes. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So there's, there's, it's, so this is, um, so we have several characteristics here that we're working with. Um, there was another interesting discussion of her on the Occult World uh, website, uh, occultworld.com, where he talks about, uh, he, uh, well, actually, I'm making an assumption. I'm not sure who the, uh, who the author is here. But Zunaqua, um, they mention the fact that Zunaqua has physical and supernatural powers. Uh, and he, mentioned, he mentions that uh, brawn or magical skill may be insufficient to defeat her. Luckily, Zunaqua is a very literal thinker. Her powers of thought are limited, so she's easily tricked or outwitted. Myths have kidnapped children and happily, as they manage to fool her and escape. Uh, and it, it said here that Zunaqua is sometimes described as stupid, but that's not really accurate. She has tremendous knowledge, even esoteric knowledge, of the woods, animals, secrets of life, death, and nature. She just doesn't think the same way a person does. She becomes easily disoriented when outside the forest and is not happy removed from wild nature. And he says in parentheses, some ways Zunaqua resembles Baba Yaga, except that Baba Yaga is very clever and sharper than most humans. She outwits us. Baba, Baba Yaga's favors are earned via good manners and hard work. Okay. It says uh, he she likes to snack on children, can be hostile to people in general. Best relationships tend to be with adult men. And those who can soothe and tame her may receive tremendous gifts. Uh, she can bestow wealth and good fortune, a font of rare knowledge, and owns the water of life. Okay, so this is, um, that's pretty pretty significant here um because we see a lot of these characteristics and now we're seeing in um the indigenous cultures of you know of, of british columbia that there's also this idea of this dark feminine that has traits that follows the dark feminine traits in a lot of other cultures so if we take a look at each one of these um okay um let me just see where I'm at here. Okay, so the first thing that I, I was thinking about is, you know, the fact that, okay, so you have this, um, you know, we, we've told the brief story of her about how, you know, you know, this idea that, you know, and, and I can't seem to get a copy of any of the particular specific tales about children who are captured by her and outwit her and then escape. There's just references to the fact that these stories exist. Um, and I've, I've been, I've been, you know, with library research and everything, I'm, I'm kind of turning up nothing on, on where to find these stories. Perhaps it's going to be in some kind of an anthropological work, um, on the, uh, Kwakwakawak, but, um, I'm not, you know, I, I've not been able to find it myself. Um, okay. So here we have the female devourer. Okay. We have this wild woman who's not happy when she's outside of, of, the woods, not out, you know, outside of the forest. And this gives her the feel, definitely, um, this definitely makes her uh, chthonic, for absolutely, for sure. Because, you know, because the woods, that wild place, that place, you know, you're, you're supposed to say in, in the safe boundaries, if you go into that wild place, you're going to encounter dangerous things, like this devouring feminine. Although, you know, if you manage to outwit her, then, you know, you might achieve great wealth. So there's almost a, an element there that we saw in the narratives in um, more Western myths of this, this kind of almost heroic kind of myth. Although I don't know if there's any specific kind of myths of, you know, a warrior going into the woods and, and somehow um, tricking um, you know, Zunaqua and, and getting something out of it. But clearly some kind of a story exists, or at least a legend exists, that this can happen. Uh, her child stealing... Uh, tendency reminds me a little bit of, of the Krampus legend because it's, it's this, although Krampus, of course, it tends to be specifically associated with Christmas time. Uh, there's this idea of bad children being taken away in a basket. Uh, and then, you know, now of course, Krampus also usually beats the children, but also, but also may devour them. And here we just have um, this kind of dim-witted, dark feminine kind of figure that, um, you know, monstrous figure that will just, just takes and devours. 
And the fact that she is, well, okay, she's dim-witted and she has bad eyesight. Okay, those are two factors that need to be thought about as well. The fact that she has bad eyesight, um, this, this again reminds me of a motif that you see in a lot of mythologies about when, when your external sight is not very good, that means your internal sight is excellent. So, for instance, in ancient Greece, you have um, prophets like Tiresias or Anchises. They lose their eyesight. They, they're blinded. And, but when they're blinded, they suddenly are able to see the future. Okay? So, again, there's not this, you know, they're, they, they're unable to see, you know, the conscious, sensual, external world, but they have an intimate knowledge of everything going on in the field kind of outside of that. Uh, which is, which again, that that's that's characteristic of the underworld because one of the reasons that people appeal to spirits of the underworld is to find out, you know, about events that are happening that they don't know about, or to find out about the future. So there is this sense that um, that um, Zunaqua has some kind of secret knowledge, but I think it's rather than maybe a knowledge of the future in this case, it's more of an intimate knowledge of nature and its workings, you know, which um, which again is a very occult or esoteric flavor to it, too, because what are most occultists trying to do? Trying to find out that, that very thing, or trying to delve into that very thing. Um, and, of course, that connection to the forest and, and, and her wildness, you know, you know, if it's... The fact that she can revive the dead, okay, there, there to me is, is a bit of an underworld connection. Um, now, I don't have anything on the underworld mythology of the uh, Kwakwakiwak, but it's, you know, I couldn't find anything on that. But there just does seem to be a thing that she is, um, you know, she, you know, there, there, there's definitely uh, this sense of her again. If, if, it, if, if at least in terms of the the type of belief, if we're looking at a type of belief that is animistic in some fashion, then again, it's not it's not so much a matter of whether or not you have a, a creator god and you know different things. You know, there there may be a conception of, you know, being with the ancestors after death or, or something like that. Um, but as we can see, there doesn't necessarily have to be a, a specific place where the dead go, or at least where the dead stay, um, as we saw in, in the, the Sedna mythology, where, you know, there is, there is an afterlife, but, um, you know, basically it's more like a purgatory, and then people go to the moon for whatever reason. Um, so... You know, it's so again. I'm not seeing that, but the fact that she is an ancestral spirit um, is very suggestive. Again, of these same kind of things we've seen with these other figures, um, perhaps out of African or Caribbean uh, kinds of belief systems, where there's, you know, where where again, it's more like in death, it's more like you're being guided by by certain spirits or certain ancestral spirits, or just certain. Um, you know, they're not, you know, again, we're not, we're not talking about gods particularly, but we are talking about certain kind of what, uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever term you want to use, elemental, demonic, they're thought of differently in different cultures, but they have that flavor of being, um, you know, the, the spirits connected not only to our ancestors and to the dead, but also to the world. And as we've talked about in other podcasts, there seems to be a very close connection between spirits of nature and spirits of the dead at least in a lot of the folklore and mythology of a lot of cultures. So, you know, so that's why I would suspect that it's, it, it's very possible. I don't have any stories on this, but, but her ability to revive the dead, <clears throat> and it sounds like she needs something to work with. Like if you re re reduce something to ashes that, you know, she can't revive. But, um, but we see this, this kind of element of her as having, having these kinds of magical powers. Now, the other piece here that I find interesting, um, okay, we have this idea of this being like almost like the hag tales that we saw, like for example, the water hags of uh, of the of the tales in England, and the uh, you know it, it's you know where people said at least one purpose of it is to frighten children into behaving. Okay, so there's there's almost a moralistic tale to it, uh, you know. If you're disobedient or you don't do what you're supposed to do, then this, you know, this cannibalistic devourer is going to take you away. And, and, and you know, and, but beyond even the whole, you know, let's scare children into behaving, I, I think there's a sense of that's, that's a means of trying to control chaos. The idea that if you, if you step into the realm of chaos, you're, you're going to run into these sort of, sort of wild natural energies that are much more powerful than you are and you risk being devoured by them. Now, um, 
she's so okay. So I see this this idea of, of having this, but but what I'm also find very interesting here is the connection to you know of masculine and feminine here. I think there's um, I was reading up. I was I was trying to look at other mythologies. Like I was looking at Bigfoot legends and so forth, cause trying to see like cause obviously we have the idea of the giant here, and we've talked about the giant in um, the podcast on Scotty. We've talked about it on, um, and even in Sedna, I mean, the, the giant tends to represent these forces that we might think of in uh, the Greek world as titanic, okay, as, as these, um, these very primordial forces, as these, you know, beings that existed prior to humans, um, <clears throat> and, you know, ha- have a means of informing uh, this, you know, you know, of, of sort of shaping, uh, you know, the light, you know, the life as we, as you know it, within that particular land or landscape. Um, and I, I had found something in my in my research. There was a somebody who had did a a master's thesis somewhere called "The Legends of Bigfoot" or "How I Regained My Manhood." And the author of this thesis, and um, I, let me just see if I can uh, find his name here at the top because I was just reading through this. Uh, it was interesting. Um, Sorry, I have a, a very slow thing. I don't have a uh, a mouse that uh, that works well, but um, yeah, Daniel Blaine McCarty, that's who he is of um, Kennesaw State University, had done this um, Master of Arts in American Studies. So he talks about Bigfoot, but what I found interesting is he he he's trying to make a in some ways a psychoanalytical case, you know, uh, the unconsciousness or Bigfoot is somehow being a motif for you know aspects of male identity, primordial male identity. Um, and I find that, okay, and, and the reason I bring that up in this particular podcast is because here we see um, uh, Zunoqua, who has all that elements of that, um, you know, that, that Bigfoot Sasquatch kind of poly, um, um, uh, aspect, okay, or this is the way that, you know, they uh, present, is actually something feminine, okay? So this goes back to what I have said about war goddesses, and this goes back to what I've said about, um, you know, the way in which the feminine functions. It, you know, in, in India, the feminine is, is active as we met. Um, well, I mentioned this in a, in a Patreon only podcast. Um, but there was the idea that Shakti is, is the, is the active feminine principle and Shiva in a sense becomes the passive masculine principle in this particular uh, construct that is called uh, Sri Ardhanarishwara. Whereas, nor- like, if we look at, for example, the, um, the yin-yang of Taoism, it's reversed. The active principle is masculine, it's yang, and the passive principle is yin, it's, it's feminine. Okay, so here and, here, and here we go again with this idea, here we're seeing in this particular mythology a, a turning around of the feminine. It's it the feminine is now the active principle. The feminine is the principle to be to be wrangled with. Um, now the fact that um Zunuqua is what quote unquote dim witted and doesn't think or act in the same way that um you know that you know it, it, she, that she doesn't she doesn't think the same way humans do. That suggests an irrationality, okay? Because how do we how do we sort things out? How do we solve problems? We think them out, right? We analyze them. This is not a creature that analyzes or thinks. This is not about thinking. Okay, now uh, she obviously doesn't mean she's lacking in intelligence, but she's pure. She is a non-rational force. So there isn't reasoning with a with a creature like this. Um, and again, I find myself thinking back to the motifs of the feminine in Greek mythology, particularly the Trojan War, where you have warriors who uh, are on the battlefield. And yes, Ares, the god of war, is on the battlefield, but so is Athena. Okay, so now you have these masculine and feminine representations of war, and they focus on different things. Ares is about brute force. Ares is just like a killing machine on on the battlefield. That's um, So when he appears, people get very, very scared. Uh, Athena is more about strategy, okay, and and you know war is not always her her mode, but in war she's the one who's clever and who thinks it out. This is why Odysseus is her favorite, 
in Greek mythology because, you know, because he's, he's clever. He doesn't, um, he, he finds his way out through quick thinking, you know, just for example, the encounter between Odysseus and the, the Cyclops uh, Polyphemus, where there was not going to be, first of all, there was no reasoning with him. He didn't have the same kind of manners. And basically his whole thing was he had trapped Odysseus's men in his cave. There was no hospitality. Um, he was just going to devour them. <clears throat> and he did. He would, he would eat one of them at a time. And so it had to be through quick wits that Odysseus was able to outwit him. And then he was able to blind the, the Cyclops, okay, and then uh, get his men out of there by, by clinging on to the bottom of his sheep so that when he took his sheep out, they were able to escape from the cave and, and get away. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's almost a, a perfect parallel example to what we're thinking of with Zunaqua. You know, she abducts these children, and the Cyclops here also in this story was dim-witted. He's not, not very bright, and he also has absolutely no, what you would think of as quote-unquote, so he doesn't follow the civilized rules of order. He has his own way of, of doing things. But, um, but Odysseus gets him drunk and then ends up blinding him when, he's, when he falls asleep. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's, so, it's, so it's a similar kind of a thing. You're dealing with an energy here, a titanic energy that does not rely on rationality. And when you're on the battlefield, um, you know, there's, there's really two ways to approach, you know, a, a combatant, an enemy. In, 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 you know, it's either going to be through direct force and attack, or it's going to be, you know, through manipulation or strategy of some kind. It's not going to be a direct approach every time. So in this case, the way to, defe to defeat Zunaqua is by that indirect force, by that, which is, again, that's, that's kind of a, a, a feminine way of, of approaching um, the battle. And what we saw in Greek mythology with warriors like the two Ajaxes, um, the, you know, the Telamonian Ajax and um, Ajax of Oileus, uh, you know, which were called um, Ajax, the greater and the lesser, I think because of their size. But... Both of them <clears throat> offend Athena. Uh, one by raping Cassandra when she's clinging to uh, Athena's statue at the uh, sack of Troy. And so he gets, you know, Poseidon ends up knock, sucking him down in a whirlpool, um, you know, in vengeance. And his, you know, his, his ship is, um, you know, he's tossed over. And the other Ajax, Athena messes with because on the battlefield, he approaches, she approaches him and he says, uh, go away, woman. I don't, I don't need your help. So, uh, you know, so she messes with him later. She makes him hallucinate, thinks that, you know, he gets upset because he doesn't win the uh, armor of Achilles. Uh, in, in the games, uh, Odysseus is awarded the, um, the armor. And so he gets, he gets very angry. And so what he does is he, um, he thinks he's going to, he, he dives a plot to kill all the generals in their sleep. But Athena instead has him kill a whole bunch of animals, which, you know, not great, but, you know, this is the way the, the story goes. And then when, a then when she gives him clear sight again, he realizes what he's done, then he commits suicide, okay? So the idea is, you, point being, you do not discount the feminine force. Men a lot of times seem to have this idea that to be masculine, this is something that they, they have to avoid all these aspects of femininity, not realizing that the power that they actually have, that the root power actually comes from femininity, okay? That's the point that I'm making here. Um, so it's interesting that this person is talking about Bigfoot as a, um, as almost an archetype of primordial masculinity or not even, I don't know if I even like the word archetype there because, well, in the sense maybe that it is something autonomous, uh, and numinous, but it's this, it's this idea, this, um, you know, it becomes this kind of metaphor for that or people, you know, somehow mystically looking to, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of in, in, the, in the unconscious imagery and the collective imagery of the society that Bigfoot, Bigfoot ends up representing something masculine. But here we see in native um, mythology that <clears throat> that Bigfoot energy as, as such, the Sasquatch type figure is conceived of as feminine. Okay. Now, again, it, it, there are male versions as well, but the primary, the primary one seems to be female. So, I think what needs to be considered here, what I find this is very interesting about um, native mythology is that, again, like you see in India in particular uh, as well, you, and, and also, as I've just noted, in parts of Greece, and again, saying this does not mean that 
they all somehow have the same idea. It's just an interesting that the way that these cultures interpret the feminine, um, these kinds of feminine forces. Because remember also that um, uh, Zunaqua can also bestow wealth. <clears throat> and um, Zunaqua is, you know, you know, so she represents this force that is, you know, she almost represents this, this feminine power or this feminine energy where if it's tapped into, it can bring great abundance. Um, it does have the potential to devour. It doesn't follow the rules of rationality. And it doesn't appear as something, you know, the way a lot of times we think of the feminine as being, you know, very beautiful or very, you know, in a very comely or attractive form. Okay. Um, it's this, it's, this is, and this is the feminine, you know, but this, but this is that, um, that raw natural force that, um, that feminine that, that needs to be appealed to, um, or, or negotiated. And the way in which you negotiate is the, um, you know, it's through negotiation, not through directly trying to conquer, attack, or overcome. So here we see some more clues about the ways in which one deals with the, with the feminine. Now, this, of course, is a type of feminine that is, uh, that has the potential to be destructive. So, the question is, you know, they, so there becomes this element of how do you tame the destructive feminine force? Um, or how do you, or probably more accurately, how do you make use of that force? How do you, how do you allow that to be a force for, um, <clears throat> you know, that you work with rather than work against? So that is what I'm going to say. I'm going to leave it there on Zunaqua. I don't want to, it's possible for me to run off on a lot of other tangents, but I think that gets to the, the core of what's said about her. Um, and without more stories, that's probably about as far as I can go with it. But, um, but certainly interesting to see that this, this ancestral spirit, uh, this nature spirit who can, who can be tricked because she's, because she's not an expert in rationality, but is, but, but does represent this, this force, this kind of force in a way like the Furies, in the sense of establishing a boundary. So she gets, becomes connected with children's behavior, okay? So there's a certain boundary to be observed. Um, you know, this is, there's, it's not about, um, and if you transcend, if you transverse that boundary, then you're in trouble, you're in danger. Um, but if it's approached in the right way, or handled in the right way, then it can be useful. Um, so that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you so much again for listening. Please visit cathonia.net for all my work. Usually I have all the updates on everything I'm doing on social media, uh, which is Cathonia Podcast. Two words on Facebook, one word on Instagram and Twitter, just Cathonia on YouTube. If you want to support my work and get extra material, uh, not just on these particular episodes, but you know, further explorations into the dark feminine and extra, um, extra material from, from other work, then please check out patreon.com slash Cathonia. Um, anybody at the $5 level and above gets at least one extra podcast a month and gets the first updates on everything that's going on and any first offers, uh, on anything that, uh, I'm, you know, uh, promoting or providing. Uh, thanks very much again. Thank you again to my patrons for your support and I'll see you in the next episode.